Um, first off, I want to thank you guys for your time. Um, you guys are very valuable to the community, and I know you have a lot of stuff going on today, so I'll, I'll be respectful of your time. Um, a friend of mine told me I need to break this down to an elevator speech, so that's where we're going. Um, quick side note, my daughter wanted everybody to know that there's only 11 Fridays until Christmas. <laughs> she ruins every year of my life with that. Um, anyway, um, the reason I'm here today is to speak um, from, from a standpoint, I'm, I'm here today not as your assistant chief, but as a member of a committee called Friends of Black Canyon Fire. Um, Friends of Platte Canyon Fire was originally established to support um, a, a mill levy initiative coming up on the November ballot, which would be called uh, 5A. What 5A represents is a 2.9 mill levy increase. Um, that would roughly generate $298,000 a year annually for the fire district. Um, that would be made up in property taxes which would equal, for a $100,000 value, would equal $23.08, give or take the math that the assessor does at the end of the year. Um, could go up a few pennies or dimes or nickels, it could go down. I'm not really sure, it's up to him. Um, why do we need this money? Um, since 2009, we have incurred a cumulative loss of $700,000 to the fire budget. Um, we're currently averaging about $150,000 a year budget deficit. Um, that budget deficit can be made up in a couple of different ways. Um, one would be through people paying their ambulance bills, which we all know not everybody's insured, and a lot of folks have Medicare Medicaid. So once we collect from those entities, we, we cannot pursue that. One of the, other, the only other way that we have of making that up uh, enterprise fund-wise would be through wildland fire deployments of personnel resources and equipment resources in the district. And that's a very fine line that we have to manage, not only with our local fire danger, but also whether or not there is a fire season. Um, so you, you may have a great fire season, which is a bad fire season for everybody else, which produces a lot of revenue, or you may have a very good fire season, meaning it produces no fire season and, and no revenue. Um, but we also have to watch and manage our local fire dangers and fire indices because as our danger begins to go up, we have to make sure we can pull our resources back. Fortunately for us, we've been lucky with some of those years, and we've been able to generate some funds to be able to make up that budget shortfall. Um, the district has cut our operating budget by 12.8%. Um, kind of give you an idea of what we've cut. We've cut out all of our training. We don't hire any new people. We haven't hired anybody since 2009. We cut our full-time district um, mechanic and now have a contract mechanic. We have ceased using outside entities to do our payroll and accounting <coughs> in-house to be able to try and recoup some of that cost. Um, the last thing that we have left to cut is people. And if we don't pass this mill levy, um, that the ballot just hit your mailboxes today, or we'll be hitting your mailboxes today. Um, the district board will be making the decision at some point in time, whether it's November 4th or January 1st, or at some point during the year, we will be laying off firefighters. Um, why is that a big deal? You guys have volunteers here. We do. Um, and in the days of, of Chief Obrick, we had a lot of volunteers. And in the days of current times, we, we don't have a ton of volunteers. And of the volunteers that we have, we have about five or six that are very active, and we have about 15 or 20 that are around where they can be around. A lot of them are business owners like you, and or they work in, work in the city and live up here, and that time to them is, is gone. Um, how that would affect you is with the reduction of volunteer numbers and the proposed, proposed reduction of paid staff, um, ISO would look at those numbers and the reassessment of that would end up increasing our ISO rating. Um, last night when I was speaking at the school district, we, we were talking about how if that number goes up, your insurance rates will go up. They could go up $150 to $200 a year and you have no control over your insurance company. You own the fire district. We belong to you. The building you're in belongs to you. The coffee you guys paid us for, you guys you own the coffee. It's yours. You can drink it. Check that out. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you don't like the way things are going on in this establishment or in this agency, then you can come by and you can speak with me. You can speak with the chief of the department. 
If you don't get the answers you're looking for there, then you can come to a district board meeting um, and you, you can pursue those avenues there. If you don't like the way your insurance company is treating you, they really don't care and they'll tell you to go somewhere else. Um, your, as I mentioned, your ISO ratings could go up. Um, it was mentioned to me last night at the school board that not only could your ISO rate or your rates go up, but as that ISO rating goes up, insurance companies are ceasing to insure in communities. So you could run into an issue with insurance companies that, that will not insure you. What's ISO? Insurance Services Office. Uh, basically, it's a rating system that's used nationally, rating from 1 to 10, 10 being non-existent, 1 being like the city of Denver, Los Angeles, Chicago, that may be major resources. Yes, sir? I was just going to testify that my homeowners just dropped me last month. They just dropped you last month? At Allstate? 25 years. Allstate? No. No. <laughs> Allstate's it's getting everybody. tougher and tougher. Now. And it's not, unfortunately, it's not the agent's fault. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not in here saying that our agents are doing that. The underwriters that carry the insurance for them want out of the areas that are being affected by catastrophic wildland fires and or floods. They lost billions of dollars here in a, in a couple of years. Um, just a kind of a big broad picture of what we're looking at here as a district. Currently, year to date, and I just pulled these numbers this morning, we've got 922 calls year to date which if we get another 50 calls, we'll set a, an annual record. Um, of those 922 calls, we've had 62 occasions where we've had multiple calls at the same, the same time, whether that be two calls at once or up to six calls at once. Um, I was on, on shift one such day when we had five calls going on at one time. Four of those resulted in transports to Denver, one of them on a helicopter, thankfully, um, for us because we wouldn't have been able to manage the fourth call. Um, and three of those resulting in ground transport with ambulances, and in the meantime, we had a wildland fire in the ranchos. Had it not been for the sheriff's office, the wildland fire in the ranchos probably would have worked out quite differently. The sheriff's deputies and the sheriff did a great job. Kudos to those guys. Um, so when you, when you look at those multiple calls, how does that affect you? Why does that justify the need for this rate, um, for, the, for the increase in the mill levy? If we've got, you know, we, we staff two of our shifts with four firefighters, one of our shifts with three. If we reduce that number any more, two things. One, we won't be able to maintain uh, an, an NFPA standard two in, two out on structure fires, meaning that if I've got two firefighters in a building suppressing a fire, I have two outside waiting to go in and get them when something goes wrong. Um, Kansas City realized that last night and lost two of their firefighters. Um, the other side of that is on a medical call, if I've got two firefighters on or two <coughs> fire medics on and they're in Harris Park and we get another call somewhere else in the district, I have nobody else to cover that second call. And we're seeing more and more and more of those multiple calls at the same time. Um, covered the effect on the ISL and I'll, I'll just come out and I'll discuss the pros and cons of, of the mill levy initiative with you guys. Um, obviously the pro of it is we continue services at their current level that our community has become, um, become to expect and rely upon, and the con being obviously an increase in our taxes. Um, but I think that that's an increase that, that is something we need to look at. Um, again, this is an organization that you guys own and manage. If you're not happy with the way it's being managed and run, then I suggest you come in and you take part in the leadership of this and help fix it. Yes, sir. Joe, you know, when I was talking to the chief a little bit about this, one of the things that struck me was the ambulance calls. And, and, and people don't really understand what that costs you and what you get back, say, from a Medicaid ambulance call, where, where the deficits come in and where, where the problems come in. Do you have some of those numbers off the top of your head? I can give you some generalities to it. I can't give you the actual numbers. I don't have them sitting in my hands. But um, an advanced life support call is a $1,900 charge. A basic life support call is a $1,500 charge. Um, Medicare pays about $75 on a call. Um, if you have supplemental insurance, Part A or Part B, then we can collect from that insurance, but they still don't pay 100% of it. Once that supplemental insurance has paid in full, or what they consider full, it's a charge off to the district. We all pay that. That comes back to us and we write it off. Um, if it's Medicare, which is the state side of that, they pay virtually pennies on the dollar um, and you're lucky to get $75 on that call. 
And once that is collected, it is written off um, for a multitude of reasons. One, legally you can't do it. And secondarily, my job is to help people not go break legs to try and collect their money. <laughs> so, so, so basically, I mean, I think the chief told me, what, y'all had 300 ambulance calls last year or something like that? Or was it more than that? It would have been more than that. Okay. 98% of our, or, well, between 90 and 98% of our business is medical in nature. Uh -huh. And and if you're only getting, if, if your cost is average around $1,700 a run, and you're only getting under $100 back, mm -hmm. There, there's money that has to be made up there, and, yep. and, and you know it's 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 a significant part, and there's it, this just doesn't magically happen, I guess is the thing. And, and we all keep continuing magically happening, <laughs> <laughs> and we keep going. But yes, the money part that never happens. Jim, yeah. yes, sir. Uh, you had mentioned it at one of the meetings about um, the time and personnel commitment to not only run that call, mm -hmm. but if they have to be taken down the mountain to a hospital. Right. What is the normal time limit if that is necessary? Uh, our average medical call that includes a transport runs anywhere from two to three hours. You, know, you have the initial onset of the call, we respond from here to the call, we assess the patient, make the decision to transport, decide on the location of the hospital we're going to, drive to the city, transport the patient there, do the patient <coughs> with the facility there reset the ambulance while we're at the hospital. That way, if we're coming back and another call drops, we're ready to go. And then when we get back here, we have report time that's not even really included in that. But people having to write out the report of what, what the condition of the patient was, what situation it ended in, and who we passed them off to, and what care was given. And how many vehicles do you currently have and teams to make those uh, calls and shuttles? Ambulances? We currently own three ambulances. One of those is a newer ambulance. It's a 2014-15. Uh, it uh, already has 48,000 miles on it. We drive to and from town a lot. Um, then we have two used ambulances that we purchased from Elk Creek Fire Protection District several years ago. Um, one's a 2000, one's a 2002, and they've got hundreds of thousands of miles on them. So um, that's vehicle count. Interesting point. I, I think I've got this right. The, the chief was telling me that the new ambulance. Uh -huh. It's not truly a new ambulance, is it? It's a new chassis. It's a new chassis. We repurposed the box, and that's that's something that we look at doing when whatever you know. If and we're looking at designing another new ambulance now. Obviously, we have to. The new one has forty-eight thousand miles on it. Um, we'll be going after a state-funded grant for that. We're hoping to get a a, a, a waiver so we would only have to match ten percent of the grant. Um, but anytime you buy an ambulance, you try and make sure that the box that you're buying is from a company that's going to stay in business. That way, if you buy another chassis in five years, you just move the box to the new chassis, um, which saves a, a great deal of money. A total ambulance uh, from you know base, you're looking at about $140,000. Um, just to buy a new chassis, um, the Dodge 4500 chassis that we currently have under that ambulance would run somewhere between thirty two and 38000 just for the chassis. Will you be available after the meeting to answer Yes, questions? I'm available after the meeting. Also, we have, uh, there's a website, or not a website, there's a Facebook page, um, Friends of Black Canyon Fire. Um, I encourage you to take a look at that. All of the information that I covered here today is on that, on that site. Um, if you don't find answers you're looking for, just message us a, a question and we'll get back to you on that. How long has it been since you were able to pass a mill levy override? We passed, the last mill levy override that we passed, I want to say it was in 2008. And that was after Platte Canyon Rescue went out of business. Yeah. And our, our purpose with that mill levy increase was to pick up the ambulance portion of the budget, which we never had. Right. Um, and then as I mentioned earlier, um, due to the recession, that's, we, we've lost that. It's gone. Okay. Well, thanks for uh, mm -hmm. helping. Did you get you to change hats. Yeah. To your position as assistant chief. Sure. Fire danger, I think I saw it was high now. Fire it's danger is high, and unfortunately we'll bounce in and out of uh, burn bands right now, and I apologize for that. I know it's a pain to follow. Um, until we get some snow on the ground, this is probably our most susceptible time of fire, um, just due to the fact that we've had all the rain all season long, we've got all this tremendous growth, it looks beautiful, and the drought is over. Um, but all of that is now cured. So even when we get rain, and or increased our ages late at night, 
as soon as the sun comes up and the wind blows on it, those are one hour fuels. Basically, it takes an hour to take on moisture, an hour to wick it away. It becomes a dangerous volatile fuel. Um, so pay attention to the burn ban signs. That's also listed on the fire district's Facebook page. Um, it's easy for me to update that. We change that anytime there's an update with that. So, good question. Thanks, well, thanks, Jeff. You bet. Thank you. Thank you.